this is IR524, Cyprus issue. This is our final week, um, final topic. We are going to look at uh, is reconciliation possible in Cyprus and prospects for the future. Um, there is an article that I also listed in the, uh, in the reading list by Rebe Rebecca Bryant. She talks about rejection of the Anand plan in year 2004 and she finds it as not a surprise but in the view of many outside observers a regrettably missed opportunity. Here she explains what she means with this. Uh, when referendum on a plan, plan to reunite Cyprus uh, marked the turning point in the island's history, um, we know that we already covered 65% of Turkish Cypriots voted in favour for the plan and Greek Cypriots on the other hand rejected it by a majority of 76%. European observers were shocked by the anti-democratic conduct of the campaign in the Greek Cypriot South. Um, Greek Cypriots rallied around a leader known for his extreme nationalism, Tassos Papadopoulos, um, but in the Turkish Cypriot side, um, the campaigns vocally supported the plan. Uh, however, uh, it's a logical but sad outcome of the ideologies and institutions that have shaped much of the island's recent history. Uh, in this article, Rebecca Bryant adds that Cyprus has been divided and trapped in a political stalemate for 30 years ever since Turkish troops landed on the island in 1974 in the response to a Greek Cypriot coup aimed at annexing the island to Greece. When UN Secretary General Kofi Annan proposed a reunification plan on the negotiating table in November 2002, hopes were revived around um, that Cyprus problem would be resolved. Both the European Union and UN officials wished to see a settlement before 1st of May, when the Republic of Cyprus was set to join the EU. Despite the declaration in 1983 of a unilaterally announced sovereign Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus, it is only the Greek governed Republic that is internationally rec recognized. This Republic of Cyprus wished to join the EU as a representative government of the entire island. So what was Anamplan about? We talked about it before, but let me repeat it here. It called for a loose federation under an umbrella government that would have limited powers over two constituent states, generally defined along the ethnic lines. The border would have followed the current ceasefire line, which is the green line, and through the line would have adjusted in order to give the Greek Cypriot constituent states certain territories that formerly had large Greek populations. The Turkish Cypriots currently living in those areas would have been relocated to newly built settlements in the Turkish constituent state. All property claims resulting from the division of the island would have been resolved either through restitution or compensation. The state of uncertainty and isolation in which Turkish Cypriots have lived for 30 years would have been replaced by citizenship in an EU member state. This is still the article of Rebecca Bryan. So I'm still um, translating, translating his, um, her um, ideas. So when Kofi Annan first represented his plan, many of the Cyprus, um, many people in Cyprus complained document contained too many blank pages. There were areas to be worked out in negotiations. Since that time, diplomatic talks, talks took place between Turkish and Greek Cypriot bureaucrats, resulted in the completion of a 9,000 page document that went before the Cypriot people on 24th of April 2004. All blanks were filled down to the design of the new um, new confederation's flag and the approval of a national anthem. Many of the thousands of pages simply listed the rules and regulations that would govern the branches of the new government, the United Cyprus Republic. But for those who wish to damage the plan, increase uncertainty in the societies. Greek Cypriot President Tassos Papadopoulos complained of the unworkability of the plan, Long-time Turkish Cypriot leader Rauf Denktash complained the no, that no one could have time to study a 9,000-page document before the referendum. So it is actually uh, a very short time given to people to read and comment and analyze this plan. Beginning with the 2002 announcement, 
Turkey Cyprus began a long, hard struggle to change their government, to gain support of Turkey and to educate the voters. The plan was approved with a majority, 65% for it have meant a new state of certainty about future. In contrast, as we all uh, also talked, Greek Cypriots um, did not want to join. They wanted their own future as the wealthiest of the EU member, a new EU member. And almost 70% of Greek Cypriots felt that they did not understand this plan, especially the complicated procedures for the return of refugees and restitution of property. So probably this plan was not very well explained to the public. The plan was presented to them in bits of propaganda. The church attacked the plan as satanic and discouraged voters in favor of the plan. The media put a heavily negative image of the plan and leading EU diplomats complained that they had not been allowed to explain their own views on the plan in the Greek Cypriot society. Also, Papadopoulos owned 33% share of the three largest private television stations in the South. So the rough media treatment of the plan was not surprising. In an exit poll, more than 70% of Greek Cypriots rejected, said their reasons were security. In separate speeches preceding the election, both Ralph Dengtash and Tassos Papadopoulos caused something of a stir in their tearful deliveries. Denktosh cried before a meeting of nationalists in Turkey. Papadopoulos cried asking Greek Cypriot community to vote for a no. In his tearful speech, he stressed three main objections to the Anan plan only two weeks before the referendum. These three points are Turkey's interests because it kept a symbolic number of troops. Number two, it kept Turkish right as guarantor power that legitimated occupation and division. Number three, if the Republic is reduced to a basic state, Turkey still has troops, Greek Cyprus must trust Turkey to fulfill its promises. Instead, he argued Greek Cyprus should hold out for the better plan that they would be able to negotiate after EU entry. So it is obvious two nationalist leaders, Rauf Dengtash and Tassos Papadopoulos, were equally sincere in their own tears. They cried for fear of what they might lose. Both leaders have been players of Cyprus political games for more than 40 years, so it's obvious um, their views were, have been very nationalistic. So when we're approaching to April 23 of 2003, there were many protests of Turkey Cyprus in favor of the Annan plan. Dengtas responded to the protests by opening the ceasefire line that divided the island for almost 30 years. This was beginning of the east to cross from one side of the island to the other. Refugees returning to their old homes, those curious to see the other side of the Green Line crossed the line for the first time. When Turkey's Justice and Development Party came to power in November 2002, it was clear that the fate of Cyprus would change. These party leaders dropped hints that Cyprus was a problem that needed to be solved because their main goal was entry into the EU. Many Turkish Cypriots were also resettled after 1974 in Greek Cypriot houses, often in areas that they knew might eventually be returned. In such areas, they were often reluctant to invest in the maintenance of houses and property because they never knew when they might have to leave. As a friend commented, we live in a false life in a made up state and now we have to face the consequences. Building trust between the two communities requires work, and work requires motivation. For more than 40 years, Greek Cypriots have claimed to speak for their Turkish Cypriot friends, neighbors, citizens, who lived in an unrecognized state and were portrayed in the media of the South as silent prisoners of an illegal regime of Turkey. Now Greek Cypriots are beginning to recognize that their Turkish Cypriot friends have political views of their own. It's only when those voices are heard in the South and real dialogue emerges that there can be hope of reconciliation in the island. And this is the end of the, um, this article that I've been telling you by Rebecca Bryant. This article is included in the class notes. Uh, you can see. I would like to talk about something else now. 
memory studies. Memory studies is a developing field of research which is primarily concerned with the ways in which relationships between past and present are expressed in various experiences from personal life narratives, personal stories to public forms of commemoration and official narratives. The politics of memory is the political methods that events are remembered and recorded or removed. The terminology addresses the role of politics in shaping collective memory, what people remember, how remembrances can differ um, from the objective truth, from the history. The influence of politics on memory is seen in the way history is written and passed on. You should always remember that history is human made. We write history books, we change history books, we prefer, we select some events more than the others. I have another article here by Marina Christofides. This is also included. She talks about um, how do we remember the past? How does each side in our ethnically divided island approach our history? And what does that mean for our future? She tries to answer these uh, questions. She talks about um, university professor Papadakis, Yanis Papadakis, who spoke on history, memory and identity. Uh, at the week of the article was written. Um, he said, just like maps of Nicosia, history is also divided. People see half of the picture, they learn half of the history, they feel half of the pain. And when we talk about refugees or the missing, we only see our own refugees and missing, never the other sides. Starting with the green line, he says, um, many Greek Cypriots assume it came into being in 1974 and never think of an existing uh, Green Line before that. The Turkish Cypriots, on the other hand, are obsessively focused on 1960s and the conflict of 1963-64, considering condensing the whole of history into that single period of time. Um, it, it, he calls it as a period of forgetting that there existed a time other than conflict. And yet, within these differences, there are also similarities. Both sides have slogans about memory that are more or less identical. Greek Cypriots um, talk about den ksehno, it means I don't forget. Turkish Cypriots talk about um, bloody Christmas memorial. Greek Cypriots will not forget their occupied lands, lost homes and villages, while Turkey Cypriots don't forget the bloody Christmas of 1963, the slaughter and violence of the 1960s, events that Greek Cypriots hardly remember at all. While researching what has to become, his book on the area around this topic, uh, Papadakis mentioned this. And um, this is what I, I mean by politics of memory. It is that our memories affect the way we remember things and the way history is written. So the term politics of memory makes its introduction in North America after World War II, developed from a social and political necessity to cope with the concept of Holocaust. To speak of politics of memory, it refers particularly to institutional approaches to deal with a violent past and events. The politics of memory makes differences, makes a reference to methods and management or coming to terms with the past through acts of justice, historical, political trials, commemorative ceremonies, dates and places, symbolical usages of different nature. Politicians frequently make references to the events of the past, or they rather uh, make reference to myths created within memory to justify their decisions and point of view of variety of issues. Then they try to gain political advantage by stressing on group specific understandings of the past in order to legitimize their actions in the present to gain an advantage in the future. So when we talk about Cyprus, we realize, as Yanis Papadakis also mentioned, uh, history is remembered differently by different groups. This is a selective memory process. It is not always easy to recognize or easy to understand, precisely because the selectivity serves a political purpose, usually to justify the claims of one group over another. Cyprus presents an especially emotional case 
of this for a variety of reasons, not only because it is a long-standing conflict with deep roots in the motherlands and their own divisive history. Memory and forgetting can be based on experience, but they can also be used strategically to give rise to different interpretations or stories of the past. Memory and forgetting are two sides of the same coin. Indeed, each provides the assumption for the existence of the other. Remembering everything is impossible, as having no memories at all. To remember everything would mean one would be in a state of total chaos, and similarly complete forgetting would create equally undesirable blank state. Instead, it is the possibility of forgetting that makes it possible to remember certain things and the opposite. Past experiences may provide the basis on which certain stories of history are expressed, but accounts of the past may also be based on official histories. Memory and forgetting are what is used to form these narratives, but as this is not one-way process, a dominant history can also affect what people remember and forget. Cyprus presents an interesting case for the examination of the ways through which social memory and forgetting are created and contested on a local, national and international level. The way these are used to structure different historical narratives can become clearer if one compares the two sides' views of the past, since both refer to the same period and an area and yet come up with different histories. By looking at what each site includes in its history, it becomes possible to also ascertain how each account implies certain forgettings. The examination of the various levels at which debates of the past take place can reveal how different views of the past are expressed and indicate how these may often be in competition with one another. When we look at both sites' official histories, uh, we see the differences. So first one, Greek Cypriot official history. Years commemorated in annual rituals, the Eoka movement is now presented as struggle of all Cypriots, also known as freedom struggle and exclusion of the left and Turkish Cypriots are unseen. The Eoka day is celebrated on 1st of April every year in Republic of Cyprus. Day of Independence, marking the independence of Cyprus is celebrated, while Greek Cypriots now regard this as a victory, as the liberation of Cyprus from British oppression, it is the truth that when it took place in 1960, it was not received in this way. The Day of Independence is celebrated on 1st of October. The last official commemorative ceremony is one of lament, as it refers to the 1974 events. These are called the Black Anniversaries of the Coup and the Invasion the 15th and 20th of July. When we look at the Cypriot, Turkish Cypriot official history, we see how the Turkish Cypriots view or construct their own history. The official commemorations of Turkish Cypriots regarding the modern history of the island start with the foundation of their own struggle uh, organization, which is TMT, in 1958. Turkish Cypriots feel that it was necessary to do this in order to protect themselves from Eoka. Also, the, there is something called the Martyrs Week, and the events of 1963-67 were uh, commemorated on 21st of December every year. So when we look at the nationalist narratives of the past, we see nationalist conceptions of the past. Um, there are two museums of national struggle. One is on the northern side of Nicosia. One is at the southern side of Nicosia. They, these national museums of national struggle museums, um, they uh, provide a history uh, with the enemy, with the image of the enemy, and with the um, uh, past armed conf confrontations, creation of a dehumanized image of the enemy. We see hatred and love in this uh, depiction. There's notions of heroism, notions of liber liberation, um, to suppose enemy and oppression. Celebrating the victory of our nation in the course of such commemorations signifies celebration of the defeat of the enemy or the oppressor. 
there we see heroes and villains. If our side is the hero, the other side should be the villain. So we see national heroes that are immortalized as saints in the National Struggle Museums. Sacrificing oneself for the nation becomes a big, important, big symbolic immortality and goal. If primary school classrooms are to be decorated with important personalities, more often than not, it is the photographs or paintings of these heroes. So educational curricula not only present the fighter hero as a role model, but also put forward the idea that ours is a nation of heroes and heroism bravery emerging as unique national characteristics. So notion of powerful enemy is required to establish heroism or our people. This can only be done due to the superior numbers of our armaments. So this is an idea that both museums are at pains to stress by providing displays of the powerful modern guns that they use next to the ones of poor quality that we had to fight with. So this is the, the how the context of both national struggle museums. War uses violence as a legitimate way of solving disputes, expand the scale of violent confrontations or spread them to stop possibilities for solving conflicts before they reach the stage of armed confrontations. To be successful in understanding of each other's experience, sufferings and fears are required as well as identifying some of the obstacles in reaching this. So they associate ideas with historic enemies, historic enemies, uh, rivalries, ethnic differences uh, are all in the portrayals of these both museums. So this was the end of the class and end of the term. Uh, please do the readings and good luck in the exams. Thank you.